Welcome everyone. This is Shane from the International Hospital Federation. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Co-Designing Transparency, Public Reporting of Healthcare Data for Clinicians and Consumers. This webinar is being presented by Carl Schucker, Principal Advisor, Publications at the Health Quality and Safety Commission in New Zealand. Just a few reminders before we proceed. All attendees will be on mute throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A tab. We'll try our best to go through all the questions after the presentation. The recording of the webinar will be available on the IHF website next week. We'll send a link to your email addresses. Now, it is my pleasure that I introduce our webinar presenter. Carl Schucker is Principal Advisor in Publications at the New Zealand Health Quality and Safety Commission. He's the author of five novels, most recently the best-selling A Mistake, a novel about errors in medicine and how we can use data to understand and misunderstand and what goes on in our hospitals. Carl, thank you very much for joining us today and we're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, thank you, Shane, and uh, thank you to the IHF uh, for hosting me in Brisbane last year where I gave a version of this talk and for inviting me to give this webinar. Um, today, I'll touch on some of the history and issues surrounding public reporting and describe the early days of New Zealand's direction. Uh, just trying to move my slide along here. So early last year, I went for some elective surgery and the surgeon that I had uh, called me sometime while I waited on the waiting list and told me that my surgeon had been changed. Um, I was told the name of the new surgeon and I went and did what I think a lot of people waiting for elective surgery do. And I Googled the name of that surgeon and this is what I came up with. Um, two reports from 10 years ago describing patient complaints about this surgeon. Uh, he also had his own website, which I've been led to believe is not a good sign for um, a surgeon working in the public hospital system in New Zealand. So the context that I'm talking about here is in New Zealand, we have a free public hospital system with a small private sector for those willing and able to pay. We also have one of the most trusted public sectors in the world, uh, as rated by the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index of 2017. However, um, the photograph here shows our ombudsman at the time, a man who'll come back into the story, uh, Ron Patterson. And Ron said that New Zealand lags behind other comparable healthcare systems uh, in disclosure of performance and outcomes information. So, I'll come to why we were put to this question, but the question essentially is, uh, in terms of public reporting, is transparency good? Uh, we are frequently confronted by scandals after which inquiries call for greater transparency, and those calls generally fall on uh, open ears and then increasingly deaf ears. The moral imperative behind transparency is, you know, I think the right one, it's, it's the expectation of a public service in the 21st century. Um, part of it is the human right to autonomous informed consent, and it is generally the future of public services. But the other question is uh, the empirical effects of transparency. What do we know about what transparency actually does in practice? And what we've found through our research is that it's complex and there's no single answer either across or within jurisdictions. Uh, in New Zealand, like in other jurisdictions, as you'll see through this talk, uh, we were put to this question by the media. Um, we have an official information act. Uh, it's a freedom of information act, essentially. Uh, and uh, Via this act, a health reporter for our major newspaper, the New Zealand Herald, requested the data of named individual cardiothoracic and neurosurgeons. And he requested numbers of procedures, mortality, complications rates, both raw numbers and rates. Um, uh, he made that request to district health boards, which are our sort of provincial um, health uh, arrangements for health, health providing and funding. Uh, and they, they variably refused him or gave him aggregated data or um, uh, irrelevant data. Um, immediately, he complained to our ombudsman. 
So the background to what he was doing then, because I think he knew what he was doing, is this. What happened in New York in, in around about 1989 to 1991, uh, the health commissioner in New York at the time uh, noted dramatic variation in coronary artery bypass graft mortality between hospitals. Um, immediately instituted registries to collect information from those hospitals on uh, what kinds of procedures they're performing and uh, who was doing them and, and how well they were turning up. Uh, that man's name was David Axelrod and David Axelrod's big moment was when he, uh, they published an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, describing the variation between those hospitals, um, anonymized. Uh, David Axelrod leaked to the media the names of those hospitals, he was talking institutional level, um, explicit mortality and complications rates. Uh, immediately the media, a periodical named Newsday, sued for the names of the individual surgeons responsible for those mortality rates. Um, the cat was essentially out of the bag. So within about a year and a half, individual cardiac surgeons had to get their houses in order because they knew their mortality rates were going to be made public. And what we see in this graph on the left here is between 1989 and 1991, a 41% decrease in risk-adjusted coronary artery bypass graft mortality. Um, this, there are very few interventions which deliver these kinds of results. And this got enormous attention and enormous um, study, subsequent study, which I'll come back to. So the other context is across the Atlantic in Bristol at about the same time, uh, dramatic, uh, dramatically high rates of mortality for pediatric cardiac uh, surgery at a hospital called the Bristol Royal Infirmary. Uh, this was discovered by a man named Stephen Bolson, who was a new anaesthetist who started collecting data. He shared the data with this man in the picture here, James Wishart, who was head of the unit. Um, Wishart was not interested. Uh, Bolson went over his head and uh, Wishart told him this extraordinary thing, which is, was not extraordinary in 1991, but it's extraordinary now. And if you wish to remain in Bristol, you should not disclose the results of pediatric cardiac surgery to people outside the unit ever again. Uh, the results of Bristol was a um, very large inquiry, and uh, this article in the BMJ, which says all changed, changed utterly, British medicine will be transformed by the Bristol case. Um, NHS England's response. Uh, sorry, there's another scandal contributing to this. And that's uh, the one we, we all remember, and that's uh, mid-staffs, Stafford Hospital um, in the UK between about 2005-2009, uh, where we saw a scandal that was materialising both uh, through consumer activism, but also patient safety alerts going to the Care Quality Commission. Uh, gradually building to a crescendo and then taken over by the tabloid culture of the UK um, alongside a dramatic, um, dramatic shift in measurement and the ability to measure and the misinterpretation of measurement. There was a um, measurement called the Hospital Standardised Mortality Ratio, which um, was essentially misconstrued by elements of the media and then this is what we call a zombie statistic. The 1,200 needless deaths that happened at mid-staffs becomes an article of faith and is uh, forever associated with that particular scandal, no matter what actually happened. So the context for this is scandal, and scandal drives calls for transparency and also drives action. So what we see in the UK is this. This is my NHS, and if you're blinking at your screen, um, you're right to do so. It's a very difficult website. What you're looking at is uh, the results of individual surgeons, uh, surgeons specializing in hip replacement in England. They essentially have two results reported here. Uh, one is the number of hip replacement revisions, i.e. the um, initial hip replacement had to be redone for whatever reason. And the second is their risk-adjusted mortality rate. So if we look closer, we have 
a lot of no relevant data available on the first metric and okay within expected limits on the second metric. Um, this website, this has, I think, I'm trying to see it here, simply pages and pages of this information. You can look up your surgeon, you know, this is an elective, um, an elective procedure. You can look up your individual surgeon and find this result and then decide for yourself if you are reassured or not. Um, it has low usage rates, as you would expect. Uh, in 20, 000, uh, 2016, 8,400 people, give or take, looked at the whole site. That's across 14 specialties. 192 people in total went to interventional cardiology. Less than 1,000 went to orthopedic surgery, while 100,000 people had hip replacements in England and Wales in the same period. Uh, doctors hate it, and I've called for the scheme to, hate, to end. However, we are seeing research coming out right now, which is associating this public reporting with improved results, and crucially, uh, not finding gaming. Uh, what we're seeing this is in colorectal surgery outcomes, which I'll come back to in a moment. 2018 research showed uh, improved mortality, um, these are before and after studies uh, necessarily. They're, um, they are confounded and also adjusted in various ways uh, worth looking into in more depth. Um, but what they're showing is introduction of, pub of public reporting of individual surgeons outcomes coinciding with a reduction in mortality for patients uh, for bowel cancer and uh, for percutaneous coronary intervention. All these, uh, these studies are contested, but they are published. So in the US, we have a very different picture. We have an absolute proliferation of public reporting. Uh, we have more than 4,000 websites. We have consumer-facing websites. We have uh, centers of Medicare um, services and state-level websites, all publishing uh, relative quality information on individual surgeons. Um, essentially, most of the ones I'm showing here are developed from Medicare, Medicaid data, but a lot of them are, their content is populated by consumers of those medical services. Essentially, TripAdvisor for surgery for medicine, ratemymd.com. Uh, there's a massive proliferation of this kind of activity in the States, and it's premised on um, a model of consumer choice. Uh, a market for healthcare, and there'll be many jurisdictions of people uh, listening to this webinar where that doesn't apply, and it just might not apply in New Zealand. Uh, here's CMS, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, Physician Compare website. It's a very slick website. Um, it shows comparative performance of Medicare physicians. You can look up your individual physician and find, find quality uh, measurements of that surgeon. However, uh, more than 1 million clinicians care for Medicare enrollees, only 239,000, 23%, had any quality information at all available on this website. Also, um, a quick uh, exploration of this website finds some extremely odd stuff. Um, one orthopedic surgeon has a quality measurement uh, he's counted in that 23%, but his quality measure, uh, measurement is that he gives out quit smoking advice. Um, we're looking at a very uneven proposition here. Here's another proposition, proposition coming out of the, uh, the US. This is from an organization called ProPublica called the Surgeon Scorecard. ProPublica are um, essentially on the side of the angels. They're a, a journalist organization um, premised on uh, free press and open society. Um, they used Medicare data to uh, rate the performance of individual surgeons, uh, which you can look up. You can look up your hospital, as you see here, John Hopkins, uh, on a number of procedures. Uh, there's a detailed methodology published on the website alongside this. Um, and then you can see uh, from green to yellow to red uh, rates of complications for uh, this selection of procedures. Um, it's essentially an idealistic project and targeted at consumers in the name of transparency. Um, 
and here we see an example of how they'd rate an individual surgeon's um, hip replacement procedure, their complications rates. At the top, we have a medium adjusted complication rate. The chap at the bottom has a high adjusted rate of complications. The fading bars are showing 95% confidence intervals. Now, this scheme, slick as it is, has shown a year-on-year -year fall in unique views of 75% since 2015. Uh, doctors have argued this scheme almost to death. Uh, Peter Pronovost has come out against it. Um, there have been critiques, rebuttals to the critiques, critiques of the rebuttals of the critiques. The arguments in the medical journals have been endless. Um, but meanwhile, the site shows uh, not many signs of being used by people. Uh, we showed this to New Zealand consumers in our particular context and they were appalled by the idea. So we have to balance this with uh, the benefits of public reporting, what has been shown. Uh, the classic example is from Wisconsin, and this is uh, more than 10 years old now, but remains the classic example of a controlled experiment. So uh, statewide, this was in Wisconsin, as I said, um, a reporting scheme was put in place, and that reporting scheme divided hospitals into three groups. One group were given no report on the quality of their services. One group of hospitals were given an internal only report. The third group of hospitals were given uh, a report and told that their report would be made public in the most public way possible via um, the media, via the internet and newspapers. And what we see is that threat of, and it is a threat of complete transparency in the public arena drove higher levels of quality improvement. Those are the black bars. The lighter gray bars in the middle were showing slightly more than the darker gray bars are the ones who received a private report on their data and the dark gray ones uh, received no report at all. These are quality improvement activities that they put in place, fairly broad category. Essentially, what they showed here is that public reporting drove action. Since then, the evidence has tended to support this. However, it has tended to support this at the uh, team, service, or institution level. And the evidence seems to be mounting up around this. Uh, we're starting to see uh, systematic re reviews uh, from 2008 on, Cochrane Review in 2011, a uh, large um, ARC technical report. Um, Gwyn Bevan at the LSE has, has sort of discussed a potential mechanism for this, which I'll come back to, and uh, a large systematic review and meta-analysis in 2016. Uh, another, however, is that a lot of the studies that they're looking at are actually based around the same programs, and those are, uh, in particular, those cardiac registries in New York. Uh, a, lot, a lot of those, what I'm saying here is a lot of the studies of the cardiac system end up populating the systematic reviews. Um, the evident, in these systematic reviews, they're saying the evidence is not strong, but it's tending to show that uh, the impacts of public reporting are at team, service, or institutional level. So what's the mechanism of change here? And Don Bowick of the IHI has been on top of this um, for a long time. He's seen two pathways about uh, reporting, uh, public reporting of quality information. The first is uh, selection, whereby patients choose higher performing providers, um, uh, better performing providers, thus forcing the lower performing ones to either up their game or leave the market. Um, the other pathway he identifies is uh, change. And change is predicated on the circulation and understanding of that publicly reported information leading somehow to change. And what we're increasingly seeing and what Gwen Bevan at the LSE is seeing is what is driving that change is the institutional concern with their own reputation. And I'll return to that. So some of the issues with public reporting and um, 
a lot of work has been done on this, so I'll go through these fairly quickly, but uh, they're important. They're important arguments um, when you see the kind of dramatic results that you have seen in some of these public reporting schemes. Um, what researchers are finding is that healthcare consumer behavior is um, inexplicable in many cases. Um, we know that there is a market failure. There is, there's incomplete information and agency between actors. Uh, we know that consumers say that they want this kind of reporting, but when they get it, they don't use it, they don't access it, and often don't trust the source agencies. Um, we know that consumers make choices of healthcare providers based on sometimes inexplicable reasons, sometimes where a family member had a good death, uh, sometimes uh, parking. The choices are described by many researchers as a black box. Why consumers choose, we don't know in health. Um, the other issue is that reporting creates differential access. We're providing information for educated, affluent people to uh, understand because the information we provide is complex. Uh, another of the issues with individual reporting, this is reporting of individual surgeons outcomes, whether that be mortality or other outcomes, is underpowered data because of the fact that they are individuals. Um, uh, one of the main studies in, in this regard came out in 2013 in The Lancet, and they showed that in the UK, uh, to get 70 to 80% uh, st statistical power, i.e. seven to eight times out of 10 when you make an inference from your data, um, you're actually correct. Uh, a, a cardiac surgeon would have to be doing between 256 to 352 procedures every year. Um, that's you know, more than one a day. Uh, in fact, uh, those surgeons are doing about 128 cardiac procedures. So the blue bar on the left, that's what they need to be doing to, so that we can call it right, seven, eight times out of 10. The uh, red cross is the number they're actually doing. It gets worse when we come over to uh, bowel cancer resection. For 70 to 80% power, seven, eight times out of 10, we're getting it right when we make an inference about their performance, they'd have to be doing 132 to around 180 procedures per year. Um, the annual number of bowel surgical procedures, surgical resections in the UK for an individual surgeon is nine. Uh, so what's the solution? Do we aggregate over multiple years? Yeah, that's possible. But how useful is three to five year old data in making an inference about an individual's performance or a change in that performance? It's problematic. Uh, a big study in uh, management science by some uh, guys from Harvard has discovered a, a particular um, feature of cardiac surgeons' individual performance is that it, it isn't portable between hospitals. They call this firm specificity. A surgeon's performance changes when he or she moves to a different hospital. Um, this, they speculate, is dependent on factors like the individual's uh, relative influence in a different institution, in a different hospital, their history there, and um, their ability to, whether it's their ability or the teams around them, their ability to work as a team. Teamwork is a major factor. So, Another issue with public reporting of individuals is uh, risk aversion. Um, I think if you talk to surgeons about the possibility of this kind of, this kind of reporting, it'll be one of the first things they will bring up. Uh, it's, there's not a lot of evidence for this. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence. Uh, there's a lot of fears that um, the most experienced surgeons working on the sickest people will actually be penalized and made to look worse by this kind of reporting, and that um, any clinician will avoid sicker patients uh, in order to look better in the data. So the importance of adequate risk adjustment that the clinicians actually are on board with is, is uh, crucial. So there are risk adjustment tools out there, such as uh, PPOSM, Euroscore, STAT, there are comorbidity scores, and ad hoc tools out there continually improved. Um, 
they're, they're not there for all procedures. They're there for the people who have got their houses in order in terms of public reporting uh, long ago, particularly cardiac. Um, inconsistent application. So one of the other issues people bring up around public reporting is that it may affect training. Uh, what incentive is there for the consultant to let the registrar, registrar uh, try a difficult procedure if it goes wrong and things go badly and it goes on that consultant's numbers. Um, there has been some evidence of a decrease in the number and type of cases, cases done by trainees. Uh, the jury's still out on this, not a lot of work has been done. One of the major issues is around informed consent. Um, as a patient, do we have the right to uh, an informed answer to the question, how many times have you done this? Um, this, this is its own very complicated area. What we see in the US is different states ruling different ways, whether surgeons have to provide volumes and complications and mortality um, data to a patient if they ask. Um, the test is generally whether that would be material to a reasonable person um, in their decision to undergo surgery. And as I say, different states have ruled different ways on this. Um, when we're talking about adequate disclosure of an individual clinician's performance or their, uh, the quality of their work, um, the standard of adequate disclosure previously in the Australia and the UK had been uh, that of the learned doctor. Um, would the learned doctor have considered this material to disclose to the patient? That standard has moved to the prudent patient and I think what we're seeing is a rapid evolution in what the prudent patient might be in law. Um, going back to those individual surgeons' uh, data, the imprecision that we saw through those low numbers, if the measures are imprecise, there's no ethical obligation to disclose them, uh, Justin Oakley tells us. Um, hence, in New Zealand, we're arguing for measures by team unit service and that's where the evidence seems to lead us. So what happened in New Zealand was our Ombudsman uh, Ron Patterson was uh, apprised of all this or, or gained the knowledge himself, did a tremendous amount of work and um, ruled this way that uh, those district health boards didn't have to report surgical outcomes but by 2021 um, my institution, the um, Health Quality and Safety Commission, that's our national quality improvement uh, body, alongside the Ministry of Health, had to work together and by 2021, select, develop and publicly report quality of care measures, including outcomes data that are meaningful to consumers, meaningful to clinicians, and meaningfully attributable to the clinicians or service providing the care. And the meaningfully attributable is a, a, a very nice um, turn of phrase, which uh, gets us around a lot of those uh, imprecisions we've identified and these limitations to public reporting. So we went out and asked New Zealand consumers, what, what do you want from public reporting? What kind of information do you want prior to a procedure? And this is what they told us. Um, clearly there's tremendous residual trust in our system, and that's not the same for all systems and social contracts. We have uh, this residual trust, which I think it's incumbent on us to, to shore up um, via any kind of transparency um, regime. Excuse me. Uh, they wanted trust and confidence. They wanted information from their own perspective, um, such as the patient journey, wait times. They wanted data on two to three key aspects of a procedure. And I think that key aspect is key. Mortality isn't everything for every procedure. Um, they wanted details, likelihood of different outcomes, risks and benefits. They wanted a mix of data and personal accounts. And they wanted the stories of expert patients, which, you know, TripAdvisor for doctors often gives them. Um, also Facebook. Patients want information about the individual surgeon. They can find it out there on the internet. Um, and I'm not sure all clinicians are aware that they are being discussed in this way. 
So from this, we, we tried to form a, a kind of theory of public reporting, how it should be done in our particular jurisdic jurisdiction under our particular conditions. And the propositions we kind of moved from were that transparency is a good thing. Um, and it's a good thing for New Zealanders in the absence of choice. The majority of our uh, healthcare is delivered through our public system. There's a small private sector for those willing and able to pay. Um, but in the absence of choice, transparency should be fair. We, based on the evidence, look at publicly reporting outcomes at the level of teams, units, or hospitals, where we see from the evidence quality improvement occurring. Um, and that the mechanism behind that is not market derived about people choosing providers, um, but it's about institutions and teams wanting to enhance their own reputations. So how do we proceed with this in practice? Um, we start by, really I should reverse these two bullets, but we, we start with where the data is already trusted and being used and worked on by clinicians, and that, that's an extant registries of uh, um, organized by uh, procedures or by uh, diagnoses uh, in different ways. Um, and coupled with that, we ask New Zealand consumers what they want. So slightly more concisely, um, we harvest existing registries for pre-existing data out there. We don't go start measuring new stuff. We go after data that doctors trust. We co-design any measures that we want out of that, um, such that they are both consumer facing and clinically relevant. Then we target consumers with good data presentation practices so that they know what we're showing. And we publish at those aggregated levels to incentivize the teamwork that we need to incentivize without making spurious inferences from underpowered data. And uh, the end goal is that providers uh, learn, engage with those doing better than them and improve. So the first registry off the rank was known as ANZAC's QI. That's the All New Zealand Acute Coronary Syndrome Registry. Uh, this is a large and robust registry of patients admitted to hospital for an acute coronary syndrome. Um, it's been around a few years now. It has a lot of patients and a lot of data. This uh, ischemic heart disease, as you're well aware, is a high burden of disease and cost in, in most jurisdictions. Um, and what we had with the clinicians running this registry is a tremendous amount of willingness and a willingness to work on uh, quality improvement. So we convened a day-long workshop, 14 consumers affected by acute coronary syndromes, clinicians, ministry, and commission staff. Uh, and what we found almost universally is that these patients told us what they wanted us to work on was discharge. Discharge was terrible. They left hospital after being treated for their acute coronary syndrome uh, with little to no information and went home in one case, sent, uh, sent home to an empty house at 3 a.m. Uh, a, a younger man, about 43 I think he was, uh, essentially terrified, no information and uh, no support. Um, many were sent home even without notes. So uh, this put us in something of a quandary in terms of uh, publicly reporting quality information about the services taking care of ACS patients. Because the, certainly the idea of choice is um, absurd. Uh, patients aren't gonna be checking the quality of their provider in the ambulance on the way to hospital. Um, are they going to be reassured after the fact, checking out the comparative uh, performance of their, whether it be their service or their team or their hospital, while at home trying to recuperate, published quality data wasn't actually what they wanted. They wanted better discharge. So what we did was find a, an existing project and uh, supported that. Um, that project is a, a, a kind of a checklist that enables a facilitated communication between the clinician and the patient um, to make sure they understood what's happened to them and what they need to do uh, to get better. 
along with other key information. So uh, that was a project to deliver on what uh, this, this co-design workshop found, and that's in use now. But we were left with, this, with a situation where we had um, uh, a need to deliver transparency. Um, so the first part of that project was to deliver that internal transparency that you saw in uh, the Wisconsin example. Uh, from registry data, we developed uh, this comparative quality, uh, comparative performance dashboard here. It's in the form of a dartboard. Um, you users can click on their region and they will be shown as a dot on the indicators around the segments of the pie. Uh, the closer to the center you are, the better you're performing on that indicator. Um, you can look to your neighbor and you can look to find out why they're doing better and uh, how you can learn from them. This was internally circulated via various networks, like the cardiac network and uh, um, the uh, sort of provincial arrangements we have, um, and eagerly received. It's you're able to digest you know, a large amount of data in one gulp. Um, it was a powerful presentation, not so easy for consumers to understand though. So, uh, we had to decide how, how, to, how to work, where to present this data. Uh, this data could be presented on a Ministry of Health website, it could be presented on our own website. Neither of these are consumer facing and the likelihood of them bringing new eyes um, is very low. How do we activate any of these mechanisms we've identified? So we went out looking for what consumers already trust um, related to uh, acute coronary syndrome and it was an NGO, the Heart Foundation. This is where uh, rehabilitation materials uh, are found and used by rehabilitation programs. Um, consumers trust the Heart Foundation, they're independent. Um, so we sought out a partnership with them and um, they saw the logic of what we were doing. So there's uh, an agreement there and we're working on developing a consumer facing dashboard uh, with them. So the next registry we're working on currently is uh, the hip fracture uh, registry. Um, we've had, had a consumer workshop with this with patients uh, with hip fracture. Um, really challenging. Uh, what we're finding is you know, these are much older patients. Uh, many don't use mobile devices at all, um, let alone actual computers. Um, there's a lot of this cohort are uh, dealing with cognition problems, dementia. Um, there's, it's also an emergency procedure, um, though a large and growing burden of, uh, on the healthcare system. This is another case where there's not a lot of interest in comparative quality data, but this is also the gateway to orthopedics and the elective side of orthopedics and discussions have begun there. So um, how I would describe this process is um, you can't be a bull in a china shop. There are the clinicians who work with these registries are aware that they're sitting on sensitive information. They're also sitting on incredibly valuable information from a quality improvement perspective. Um, any unrest they have and the approach that's being taken is, is going to uh, kill any kind of transparency project, certainly in the way that we're approaching it, which is um, via uh, you know, a co-designed approach where clinicians actually want to use the data in the way that we're presenting it. So we're moving slowly but steadily. Um, and we start from the premise, you know, as a consumer, what would you want to know in your particular case? Essentially, uh, transparency is, uh, in New Zealand, we're approaching it as a bespoke project. Uh, one size doesn't fit all, uh, it doesn't fit all patients, it doesn't fit all conditions. Um, we approach each uh, grouping, uh, and naturally grouped by registry as uh, its own particular configuration and landscape and we navigate that landscape with clinician on one side and consumer on the other. And that's probably the end of what I have to say, but I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Carl. We'll start reading some questions from the audience shortly. Just to remind everyone that you can send your questions by typing them in the Q&A tab. Um, Carl, here is our first question. Is there any role for reporting of individual surgeons' outcomes? It, it's a tricky question, and I think um, in some cases, I think the, the coronary artery bypass grafting um, has shown that there clearly is a role. And in New York, they have shown that um, it, it's been a, a powerful tool, and now it's widely accepted. So you have to examine the data, and you have to go where the data is strong enough to support the inferences that you are going to make. This is why I talk about a bespoke approach. Um, individual surgeon reporting is not something you just slap on everything. It, it, it has to be approached carefully and with some solid statistics brains uh, looking at the data. Okay, um, here is our second question from the audience. Whose job is it to deliver transparency? Uh, this is a tricky question. And, and, and I think this is a lot of this is the reason why we, we see so little progress in transparency. Uh, is it the clinician's jobs? Is it the central agency's jobs? Um, what I will say is that if it's not delivered in some effective way by the profession or by the profession and its regulators, then consumers will do it for you and uh, you might not like what they do. Um, the, the grassroots kind of activity you see in the US, the kind of uh, ratemymd.com, there's a lot of activity. Uh, there's a website called White Coat, where they're essentially providing a portal for, for uh, consumers to rate their clinicians and discuss them, and then uh, monetizing that through our being able to make appointments with clinicians you like the sound of through their website. Uh, these kinds of efforts, I think, will only continue and grow. So if, if we don't deliver it, um, then it will be delivered for us and perhaps in a way we don't like. Thank you, Carl. There's another question here. What are your thoughts on private reporting for QI? Private reporting for QI? Um, I, my thoughts on it, I, I, I think it's essential. Um, I, I, th I assume we're talking about sort of uh, clinical audits and sharing of that information. Um, I think it's absolutely essential. Uh, I think a lot of that kind of work is done around registries, which is um, often protected in some ways by, by legislation in different jurisdictions. Um, we have a thing called the PQAA, um, where a certain quality improvement activities are protected from being um, from the Freedom of Information Act being used to access that information. Uh, I think it's absolutely essential. It's it's happening unevenly. You know, it, it, it'll be quite shocking to consumers to learn that the data exists but aren't being actively used to improve quality. Uh, in in some you, essential but not being used as perhaps they ought and and that you know someone will come knocking looking for those data to be made transparent at some point thank you once again another question from our audience how does public reporting work beyond doctors for example in nurse or midwife led services hmm. uh, that's a tricky question. I, I think, I think we ought to arrange public reporting with the consumer's perspective in mind. So the consumer perspective of a particular service, um, you know, it may be that you're reporting the outcomes of a patient who's who's had a you know a, a nurse or midwife led episode of care. Um, it's a tricky question. I think the, the outcomes that we publicly report ought to be relevant to the patient. So the relevance to the patient, you know, mortality after a prostate resection, you know, the, some things are obvious nonsenses. Um, 
some things can be publicly can be privately shared, which are probably less relevant uh, to consumers. And you know, they will tell us that in these co-design meetings. Uh, I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but essentially what I'm trying to say is that you take the perspective of the patient uh, when you're talking about publicly reporting, always with an eye though to that, uh, to that reputational lever for QI. Thank you, Mark, for answering the question. Our last question for today. If a consumer tells you that you want things other than transparent published outcomes, do you still have a responsibility to somehow deliver transparent published outcomes? This is tricky. This is uh, essentially the space I'm negotiating. And um, to some extent, I would say yes. I, I would say that you know, the knowledge that publicly reporting outcomes generates a quantum of quality improvement, um, despite the fact that it may not be wanted by consumers, there's an ethical obligation there. And uh, this, is, this is the tricky road that I'm negotiating is that, um, could we be put in a position of giving people something they explicitly tell us they don't want, uh, if, if it generates improvement, then, you know, I think the ethics say we ought to do that. Okay, that's great. Thank you everyone for sending your questions. If you think of any additional questions later on, you can contact Carl. Um, we will provide these contact details or you can tweet him at Carl Schuker. Carl, is there anything else you want to say before we end our webinar? No, just I want to say thank you and thank you Shane for looking after this so well. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Carl, once again, and thanks for everyone who joined us today. We will be posting the video recording and the slides on our website next week, and you will receive the link in your email addresses. Also, we have a very quick survey, which will be displayed on your screens right after the webinar. We'd greatly appreciate if you can provide your feedback. Thanks again, everybody, and I hope you ha all have a great morning, afternoon, or evening ahead of you. Goodbye.